we want to start with you and start very, go right to the heart of the matter. From your perspective, uh, what is dehumanization and why is it that we seem to all tend throughout history to dehumanize others? Um, I would say, and let me check, can you hear me in the back? No. Not from where no. I'm can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I'd say at its most basic level, uh, dehumanization refers to a tendency that we have to see other people and particularly members of other social groups as less than fully human. And what we mean by that usually is uh, that we see them as less capable of embodying the full range of human emotions, human qualities, human intellectual capabilities that we might afford to other people that we would see as, as fully human. Um, and so seeing them as, as lesser beings, we have a tendency to think that they might not be entitled to the same uh, quality of behavior that we would afford to people that we would regard as more fully human. And it was as I was thinking about these issues, I was also thinking about how another way to think about dehumanization is also um, who we're inclined to include or exclude from our circles of moral concern, who's basically worth being concerned about and who's not necessarily being worth being concerned about. That's like yeah. my brief version. But. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, similarly, that um, I just think it's, it's interesting that we have a number of moral prohibitions against harming others, but these are all predicated on the assumption that they're human. Right? We don't have the same moral prohibitions against harming animals in general, right? In fact, we use them for sport and food and clothing. So um, if you uh, define someone as outside of of uh, humanity, then the, the moral uh, the, the problem is you might have some moral disengagement with, with their welfare. And the um, so the, the other answer to the question is how we try to measure it as as a scientific community. And um, there there are three kind of uh, I think primary ways that that you might think of dehumanization. One is um, thinking of kind of objectification. So thinking of someone as an object, this, this might be like the objectification of women or uh, of prisoners or uh, of athletes in uh, NCAA programs. This type of uh, objectification is, is maybe a type of dehumanization. Another type that's commonly thought of is mechanistic dehumanization, thinking of them of, uh, of people as like a cogs in a, in a machine. So workers might be thought of in this way. People often, uh, this, is, this is often the type of dehumanization that's applied to like uh, Chinese uh, or Japanese. Um, people think of collectivist cultures sometimes as a little bit more mechanistic. And the last one is animalistic dehumanization. So thinking of them in terms of animals. So they embody some of the characteristics of animals. Uh, but, but all three of these have the kind of similar characteristic, which is they're all removed from moral concern. And there's also this element of uh, denial of, of some kind of uh, mind to them, mm -hmm. that they, they don't have the full capacity uh, of reason and compassion, and so emotions and, and feelings, uh, and ability to think that, that kind of we do. Could I follow sure. that? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just uh, hearing Emil talk about objectification, I think another useful example that might be a little more accessible to us in common language is stereotyping. Because essentially, when we just apply a stereotype of a social category and basically say all those people are just like that, we're simply treating people on the basis of that category membership and not really recognizing their full humanity. So even though we might think about dehumanization in more extreme contexts, like cases of mass violence or genocide, um, I think there's also many everyday ways in which we have a tendency to dehumanize people. So I just wanted to unfortunately raise that <coughs> as well. Great, and I, all these things are clearly on a scale, and I think that leads really to the next question around um, the kinds of measures that yeah. you've developed and uh, to, to sort of look at degrees of dehumanization. And uh, so if you could tell us a little bit about what that research has shown, sort of summarize some of the, the key findings. Mm -hmm. And then maybe also tell <coughs> us uh, why you chose to focus on refugees, immigrants, and Muslims in your analysis. Yeah. Um, so 
I have been focused on um, specifically trying to look at animalistic dehumanization because that's the type, the flavor of dehumanization that seems to have accompanied um, a lot of like the darkest chapters in human history, from genocide to, to warfare to colonization to slavery. All these groups are depicted as animals really commonly going back through history, right, and very explicitly. And so um, there, there's been a big interest in social psychology uh, uh, on dehumanization. It, it kind of formally started really after the Holocaust. Um, uh, but, but there wasn't really an attempt to, to really empirically measure dehumanization until around 2000. Mm -hmm. and, and then the measures that came out were, they focused on um, trying to measure dehumanization in a really subtle way that people might not even be aware that you're measuring it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the assumption there, I think, was that, um, that maybe dehumanization still existed today, but, but kind of as echoes of, mm -hmm of colonization, that people might not be willing to admit to dehumanization, and uh, even if they were, they might not even be aware of how they were dehumanizing groups. And, and I think this is really fascinating research, but um, I helped sponsor this conference uh, between uh, scientists who are studying dehumanization and people who actually experience dehumanization, so uh, Native Americans, um, Palestinians, uh, the Roma minority population in Europe, and uh, and what they said, basically after the conference was, you know, they, they were really fascinated with the science, but they said, but but the way that we are experiencing dehumanization isn't so subtle. You know, we are being called dogs, you know, and and, and and you know, bananas are being thrown at us as we're playing soccer on the field. So, um, so we actually just uh, wanted to see if we could measure. Uh, just blatant dehumanization, if people would actually be willing to cop to this level of dehumanization, whether it went beyond just the anecdotal examples, um, and whether it could provide a meaningful measure that could predict anything else that we cared about in the real world. So that we've, we've measured this a few different ways, but the, the first uh, way we did it was to just be as uh, blatant and offensive as we possibly could. And what we did is we just gave people the um, ascent of man diagram inspired by Darwin, you know, the five images of evolution. And then we just listed groups underneath and we gave them sliders so they could move the slider over to indicate how evolved and civilized they considered these groups to be. And uh, we've now done this uh, on four different continents uh, with about you know, 10 or 20,000 people in 10 different countries. And it's really consistent. Um, people are uh, perfectly willing to rate other groups below their own on this scale. And the degree to which they do it is a really small <coughs> predictor of all the nastiness that we see in the world. So uh, from uh, attitudes towards the Roma minority population in Europe. So to give you an example of how big this dehumanization sometimes can be, if you just convert that to a 100 point scale, we could measure the amount of dehumanization as how much lower people put a target group than their own. So if we do this in Hungary, for example, Hungarians will rate Hungarians here, and they'll rate the Roma about 30 points lower on the scale. Right, so so the, uh, that means they're just over halfway on the, the kind of evolutionary ascent scale. And the degree to which, across individuals, the degree to which they, they dehumanize uh, the Roma predicts things like their endorsement for um, really draconian policies like um, uh, forced sterilization of Roma women who have a number of children. And this might seem totally outlandish, but the Czech Republic actually had to apologize for this in the 1990s because they were actually implementing this program. So it, it is a program that has been in place in the past and people will endorse it to the extent that they, they believe the Roma are less than human. And, uh, and in Hungary also, it, it isn't just these blatant policies. We also looked at uh, this dehumanization measure among teachers in training. And we asked them to do this task where they placed supposedly placed Roma and non-Roma children um, into educational tracks. So into the lowest track, which denies you any chance for <coughs> secondary education, versus an intermediate track or a high track. And we found that teachers, you know, somewhat unsurprisingly, even if the qualifications were identical, if they thought it was a Roma child, they would tend to place them into the lower track, right? But that was predicted by how much they dehumanized the Roma in general, 
and was not predicted by how much they disliked the Roma. And in fact, the teachers who did this the most, who, who showed the greatest amount of discrimination, were teachers who liked the Roma and dehumanized them. So this, I think, is just a really nice example of, of what we've seen in the past, right? Of, of a colonialism, uh, of a paternalism that's often applied to minority groups, like removing uh, native children from their families to educate them in boarding schools. Right? That can be cloaked, uh, and it might actually be cloaked in, in caring about those children, wanting to do the best for them, but if it's combined with dehumanization, uh, then what, what was the saying, like you, you want to save, kill the Indian to save the man or something, like, like th this is that, that type of sentiment seems to map pretty well on these elements of dehumanization. And so, uh, yeah, we've looked at it all over the place. Um, the, the, the strongest levels of dehumanization I've found so far uh, uh, have been in Colombia towards the FARC rebel group. Um, so I've been working down there because, uh, you know, Colombia just signed a peace treaty with the FARC rebel group the degree to which uh, Colombians reject that treaty is based on how much they dehumanize uh, FARC members. So quick question, when, when, you, when you ask people to rate or to move these sliders, the question is around whether they see this group as more or less civilized. You use the word civilized no matter what <coughs> language or a translation of that. And then you actually have that image of the ascent of man. Yeah, uh, so we've done it three main ways. One is to, to describe it a lot, how evolved and, you know, some people think that other groups are less evolved and civilized and some think they're more evolved and civilized. How evolved and civilized do you consider these groups? We've also tried it just giving them the, just the graphic image and not giving any explanation whatsoever and people respond just the same. So it's very intuitive, right? <laughs> people know what you're trying to get at uh, with the scale and they know, uh, so, and they, they respond accordingly. Yeah. yeah, Linda, your thoughts. So I, I want to just highlight um, or reinforce one of the points that Emil said about his research, which is why I think it's so great, which is that um, that it's important to distinguish between dehumanization and prejudice, because so much of the research in our field has focused on prejudice. How do you reduce prejudice? How do you get groups to like each other? And the focus on dehumanization kind of shifts the focus a bit to say, it's a little bit more closely tied, I think, to policy implications and how we treat people as compared to just liking. Because I think it's very easy for many of us to distinguish between liking people and saying, oh, well, um, you know, I like people, I think they're fine, I just choose not to live near them, I just choose not to support things that they care about. I, you know, and so I think this issue of dehumanization is, is particularly important because of those broader policy implications. And as a related piece, just to kind of also give you some flavor, um, in some research that Emil and I have done with like mutual colleagues uh, in, in Hungary, uh, there was another study that we, where we had looked at uh, what types of family conversations non-Roma Hungarians have about the Roma. And then we did a content analysis basically coding the types of responses that people say they would have likely heard around the dinner table <laughs> with members of their family and trying to say like, oh, so, you know, mention one positive thing about the Roma that you might have heard among members of your family around the table, or mention one negative thing you might have heard. And the negative things were like, they are scum, they're vermin, they're taking over, they should be all killed. It's, it, again, it's, it's very much reinforcing. So it's not merely that people are being primed by the ascent of man graphics, uh, but when you just ask people spontaneously the types of things that come up in conversation in their families, in their homes, we see similar types of trends. So and I, I imagine in many cases like that, you'd see a kind of convergence of prejudice and dehumanization. Mm -hmm. But it seems like you're making this really critical point, and you are too, that the two don't necessarily go together. Yeah, and, and actually, when it comes to attitudes, we might have mixed attitudes, right? So there right. would be a lot of people who say, like, they play music beautifully. Right. Um, I just don't want them living anywhere near my people. So, you know, we can have positive and negative attitudes concurrently, but dehumanization, I think it's hard to say that you're going to both rehumanize and dehumanize at the same time. It's a little more of a switch, at least I would think so. I'm, I'm kind of curious to hear your thoughts on the Yeah, well, one of the things about, I mean, I think one of the chilling things about dehumanization is that it does seem to be this cold calculation. 
right? That it's it's not necessarily driven by how you feel about the group. That that you kind of um, and and the you know one of the ways I tried to get about this is is put people in the scanner while I'm having them judge these groups on a feeling thermometer scale, which is a standard way of, of measuring dislike or prejudice, right? so how warm or cold do you feel towards these groups, and to judge the same groups on this dehumanization scale. And what I found is that there are completely different brain regions that are active when they're doing this. So these are, these are separate processes when people are making these judgments. And one thing I was really looking for was just to see if there was any hint of activity in kind of the, the emotional limbic areas when people were doing the dehumanization judgments, and there just wasn't at all. So it, it really seems like it might be this cold calculation of, hmm, you know, how human are they? And, and that, you know, can really inform policy decisions. But yeah, and it also suggests that, um, that there might be two separate <coughs> routes to intervene, yeah. that, that intervening just on people's emotional responses to a group might, uh, might miss some of the perceptions that are really driving their, their support for these, uh, for policy. Yeah, that makes sense. Sorry, no, I just yeah, also want to add, time. Mm -hmm. um, so also just thinking about, uh, like when I hear Emil say a cold calculation, I just want to also mention that it may not be entirely conscious, right? Yeah. That, there may be people who are, you know, a little more sinister and really thinking about it, but I think there's also just kind of this perhaps gut level feeling of like, nah, like <laughs> they're not people that I need to be concerned about. Um, so that's just also something else to, to keep in mind. Yeah, and you know, I, um, I was waiting in line at the taxi line in DC one time. This is right around when Obama was trying to decide whether to sign the nuclear accord or not. And I was behind this guy who was a reporter who was reporting on this and he was appalled that Obama was considering this, and, and I asked him, I said, wow, you know, that, that really surprises me because it seems like, seems like a good idea to me um, to, to actually try peace this time rather than trying to blow somebody up. And, uh, and he said, well, Iranians are bad actors, so rewarding them with a peace deal is like giving your dog a treat after it's peed on the rug. Oh. And I thought that that was such a perfect description of a, of a dehumanizing example that you know you can you can think of people learning in different ways. <coughs> Animals learn very directly through uh, through this type of uh, of system, and you know you can see people applying that to other humans. You can imagine teachers applying this kind of. Uh, uh, method of learning to black students but not white students and again yeah like you said maybe not even realizing that they're using a different logic for each one and so when you say cold and calculating or it's not lighting up the parts of the brain that are more to do with emotions is it more of what we would colloquially say is sort of cerebral more of a kind of like rational hmm I'm yeah, we don't, I mean, I don't know enough yet exactly about what it is. Uh, the, the one, the, and there's not a whole lot of research on this yet. So some brain regions are really well characterized, right? There have been a gazillion studies and they all show activity in this one area. But if you do a study that doesn't have a whole lot, you find a brain region active and there hasn't been a whole lot of research that's shown activity there, you don't feel very confident in saying what exactly it's doing. So, I mean, I think the most, provocative is that there are a couple of studies that have had people um, judge the status of others, the social status of others, and that does seem to uh, activate uh, regions that are similar to dehumanizing. And I think that it would make a lot of sense for dehumanization to follow along with status. Yeah. Right? And this is something that primates care a lot about, status, right? So it makes sense that that would be a brain region that, that would be activated when you're making dehumanization yeah. judgments. And has your, what's your research suggest about the impact of dehumanization on those who are dehumanized? And what do you see about as the social implications of that? Yeah, so uh, we, we have referred to this as meta dehumanization. So how much I think you are dehumanizing me, right? And you and me is usually a target out group and me is my in group. So how much is that group dehumanizing my group? And uh, this matters a lot. <laughs> so one thing we've been looking for is, well, what drives dehumanization? What are the things that feed into it that, that get people to dehumanize another group? This is one of them. If you think the other group thinks of your group as less than human, that is a strong trigger to getting you to both dehumanize them in return and uh, advocate for all kinds of nasty 
towards it. <coughs> and uh, so this, this, I think, I see this a lot in rhetoric about Muslims, mm -hmm. right? Muslims, uh, so I think probably the more people endorse the idea that, that Muslims see us as infidels, yeah. right? that idea, I think, is probably kind of rooted in dehumanization. They are dehumanizing us, and the response to that is very strong. To dehumanize them. Yeah, but of course, dehumanization is most often directed at marginalized groups. So there's also an effect on people who are dehumanized uh, commonly, right? So Americans being dehumanized by Muslims, I think is interesting and important because all the Pew surveys show that that's just not true, right? So it's a, uh, it's a perception that doesn't match reality, and I think that's interesting, but also important because that's the type of thing you might be able to correct. So you might be able to correct how someone is feeling dehumanized by another group, and that might be an indirect way of decreasing their dehumanization mm -hmm. of that group. Mm -hmm. right? and, and that's what we've started to do, is do interventions that aren't directed at how much you dehumanize another group, but how much you think the group dehumanizes you. Mm -hmm. And these indirect approaches in our hands are more effective than the direct ones. Can you give an example mm -hmm. of an yeah. intervention? That yeah, so that? Um, we, we just did this. So our, our first attempt at this was looking at uh, dehumanization of Americans, perceived dehumanization by Iranians around the, the nuclear accord. And we found that the degree to which Americans felt dehumanized by Iranians predicted their um, their opposition to the peace deal and their, their support for war and their willingness to sign petitions to congressional members to do this. Right, so it, it predicted these behaviors, um, whereas uh, prejudice, how much they disliked Iranians, uh, didn't predict it much at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the degree to which Americans thought we were, that Americans were dehumanized by Iranians predicted how much they dehumanized in turn and how much they endorsed these policies. So what we did is we, um, we wrote a fake Boston Globe article, <laughs> uh, but we populated it with actual information from, uh, from a, a compilation of Pew surveys that was published just a couple of years ago. Those Pew surveys collected across the Muslim world over 10 years, and, uh, and it showed that by and large, Muslims had very positive views both of Americans and America, despite all the interventions overseas. For example, the, they asked them, what are two, the two things you respect most about the United States, and what are the two things you respect least? And the two things that Muslims respect most about the US are the same two things that Americans respect the most about no, the US. Gosh. And the two things that Muslims respect least about the US are the two things that Americans respect least about the US. Do you remember what they were? Uh, well, the respect least is like, um, uh, like a degradation of the family unit mm -hmm. and, uh, and um, I can't remember the other one, but mm -hmm. respect most is like you know democratic institutions mm -hmm. and, and freedom and mm -hmm. freedom of the press, things like this. So, yeah. So you showed these articles. Yeah. So showed these articles, and the people who saw these articles, uh, read these articles, uh, dehumanized Muslims or dehumanized Iranians less than, than those who didn't who read a, a Dutch article. Yeah. <laughs> Your thoughts? Um, well, golly. So there's a there's some there's some research parallels um, with some of the work that people in my lab have done um, looking at racial and ethnic relations in the U.S. So just to kind of give an example um, of some of the things that we're dealing with here at home. Um, so when we've asked people about perceptions of other groups and meta perceptions, so it's similar to the dehumanization and meta dehumanization. So um, how interested in intergroup relations and contact across group lines I think members of other racial and ethnic groups are towards my group and also how I feel towards their groups. Um, and what you usually see is some reciprocity. That's not too surprising, right? The more I think they want to interact with people like me, the more inclined I am to interact with people like them. Um, but then we've also tried to look at what that means in terms of people's conceptions of diversity and the extent to which diversity is valued. Um, and there we see some really interesting asymmetries between white people and people of color. Uh, so again, kind of getting to how the status differences of the people that are perceiving or being perceived really does seem to matter. So we find, for example, among white Americans that what really seems to matter is how much they value diversity. If they personally think diversity is a good thing, then they're more interested in getting to know members from other groups. But for people of color, we've replicated this across a few studies, it doesn't matter so much how much they value diversity. What matters is the extent to which they think whites value diversity. Mm 
if they think wise value diversity, then they're willing to engage in those cross-group interactions. So again, you can kind of see that there are these, these status differences in how groups are conceiving of their, their position in relation to each other and what types of information they're using to, to make judgments. Um, so I can imagine how Americans, it might be nice to hear that Iranians feel positively towards us, but given the, the status structure on the yeah. world stage, that might not matter as much to the everyday American as compared to how Iranians think Americans feel towards them, right, in terms of the implications for their nation. Yeah, and I think this, this idea of meta perceptions more broadly, so, I mean, we shamelessly cribbed the idea of meta dehumanization from Linda and others who had done the meta perceptions work. Uh, but I think, like, thinking of this more broadly, um, so again, if you have, if your meta perceptions are accurate, there's not a whole lot, like, you don't want to attack those meta perceptions because there's nothing really to attack, right? If they're, so Democrats and Republicans on this dehumanization scale, they dehumanize each other quite a bit and equally, and it's equally predictive across both groups of nastiness. And their meta perception is pretty darn accurate. If you ask Democrats, how do you think Republicans will rate you? Um, it's pretty close to how Republicans actually rate them and vice versa, right? Um, Democrats think that Republicans will dehumanize them, us, a little bit uh, less than, uh, a little bit, yeah, a little bit less than they actually do, um, and Republicans are spot on. Um, so, so to me, that means, okay, great, so take that off the table for me as, as an intervention, but if you have something like FARC, so for the FARC rebels, um, Colombians think that FARC has no interest in peace and no interest in integrating. And those things are just categorically false. And so that gives you an opportunity when you see this mismatch where you can actually start targeting something. And Democrats and Republicans aren't accurate about everything, right? If you ask them, so I've asked Democrats and Republicans, this is kind of an old paradigm that was used in the 70s and I've tried to resuscitate a little bit. If I ask people, how, how do you feel about uh, gun control or uh, open versus closed borders or this scenario where a white police officer killed an unarmed black suspect, where do you fall on this spectrum of, uh, say, for the officer and the suspect, who holds the most responsibility? So make your rating, great, they make their rating. Then I ask them, where do you think the average Democrat would rate on here? And where would the average Republican rate on here? And the interesting thing about this is you can get Democrat ratings and their perceptions of other Democrats and other Republicans, and you can get Republican ratings and their perceptions of Democrats and Republicans. And the interesting thing is there's a real ideological divide that you can measure, right? The average Democrat is here and the average Republican is here. But both Democrats and Republicans are in complete agreement that the ideological divide is twice as big as it actually is right? on every issue we've looked at. So this is this is an opportunity for intervention, right? Because if we are basing our hostility towards the other group on where we think they fall on this line, and it's twice as big as the ideological divide actually is, that's a problem. So, and that's an opportunity to, to, to intervene. Yeah, no, it suggests a lot in terms of, of intervention. Linda, wanted to move a little bit um, to your work on empathy and apathy and ask you in particular in relation to um, the zero tolerance policy around immigration. And Melika shared earlier with me this uh, Quinnipiac poll in June that 55% of Republicans supported the policy um, to separate adults from children as they crossed the border so that um, the adults could be persecuted. Uh, Louder, please. Sure, sure. So sorry, hold the mic up. So we're asking Linda to talk a little bit more about her research on empathy and apathy. And as an example, um, to think about the zero tolerance policy around immigration, the fact that according to a Quinnipiac poll, 55% of Republicans supported separating adults from children at the border, um, and just what can be done to, in, I mean, not to single out Republicans, but what can be done to increase empathy for the effects of such policies on immigrants and minorities? Oh, just a, a little question. A little question. Um, <laughs> so I'd have to say, you know, from the last 20 years that I've been an academic, 
for me, the, the million dollar question is how do you motivate people to care when they don't have to? Um, and just to, to try to give some background as to why I think that's such a crucial issue for us to consider, the way that our minds work, uh, there's a, a couple of social psychologists who say that we like to act like cognitive misers, that we're, we're inherently motivated to try to conserve our cognitive resources and not think about things more than we actually have to. And I would, I would venture to guess that similar processes are at play, not only when we're thinking about cognition or how we process information, but also from a motivational perspective, that we're not motivated to think about things or people unless we absolutely have to. And I think keeping in mind that we're, you know, we're motivated perceivers, that we are constantly, whether conscious or not, making decisions about what to focus on in our social environments, because we can't pro possibly take in all the information that's out there or read all the news coverage that's out there. So we select, we focus on particular things more than others. And so I think about that as kind of undergirding my interests in empathy and apathy because you know, people in more like an individual differences tradition in psychology would talk about empathy as a trait, as a characteristic that some individuals are more empathic than others. But some of the research that, that we have done also looks at kind of the intergroup dynamics involved in empathy. And in some of the research that we've done, where we look at how contact between groups can help to improve intergroup attitudes, we've also found that empathy is one of the key drivers through which uh, contact helps to improve attitudes, that it's not just a direct relationship between more contact, less prejudice, for example, but there are a couple of roots that seem particularly crucial that are both emotional in nature, one being that contact helps to reduce our feelings of anxiety and threat in relation to other groups, so the more contact we have with them, the more comfortable we are around them and with them, and also that greater contact is associated with more empathy. Um, and we can think about that as either a greater willingness and or ability to empathize with what other groups are going through. And I, I actually think about those in a kind of sequential model where we, you know, through contact experiences, we can often reduce those feelings of defensiveness that can correspond with anxiety and threat, which then makes people more open to being willing to empathize and take the perspective of others. Um, Regarding apathy, I have to say my interest, my, my research interest in apathy really grew since the election in 2016 uh, because I was really struck by how many people, you know, in those last few weeks of the election season, there's always those interviews with people like, oh, I'm undecided, I just don't know. <laughs> um, and I was struck by how many people I, I saw in, in news headlines saying things like, oh, race yeah, that's not really my thing, or that's not my problem. And, uh, and I think it very much relates to everything that we've been talking about in terms of dehumanizing or having kind of a, a switch turned off that, oh yeah, I don't, I don't need to tune in to that station because it's not relevant to me. Um, and so I, I've been trying to do some research to see whether empathy and apathy are really flip sides of the same coin. Is it like one the opposite of the other? And uh, I've studied this in a few different ways, and it, they, it doesn't appear to be the case. They're independently contributing to predicting attitudes towards immigration. And you might imagine people hire an, a sense of apathy regarding racial and ethnic issues um, and have less uh, supportive attitudes towards, towards immigrants. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know a lot of your research has focused on contact theory and, as a, and contact, that contact does increase empathy. Can you say a little more, is it any kind of contact? Is it particular oh, types no. of contact? <laughs> what would you say? Yeah, um, I, yeah, I really appreciate uh, your raising that question because <coughs> I think there's a temptation to say, all we need to do is bring groups together and then everything's going to be great. And I think we have to keep in mind that just in terms of numbers of hours or numbers of days, it's absolute value terms. The more contact that groups have with each other, the greater pro probability that they will have some negative contact as well as positive contact. <laughs> that we can't assume that it's always going to be positive. But I think what really does seem to matter so much is having meaningful engagement across group boundaries. That it's not enough to necessarily um, 
buy your lemonade from the same cashier every day. You that might, you know, you might start up conversation. There's the possibility, but you know, if someone is just swiping a, a SKU code and then letting you on your way, that's not necessarily going to be the type of contact experience that will really transform attitudes or social relations. And and there's a few different ways that the research literature has talked about contact and what's necessary for contact to really transform attitudes. Uh, one tradition in that literature would say, we really need to think about characteristics of the situation in which groups are coming into contact. Um, and that's coming from an assumption that a lot of contact will be negative, and that um, if we just leave people and groups to their own devices, there's the potential for conflicts to break out. So we have to think very carefully about how we structure situations to maximize the potential for achieving positive outcomes. So, uh, those types of optimal conditions to promote positive outcomes from contact would include things like equal status between the groups in the contact situation, that even if they are of different statuses or power relations in the broader society, that when they're brought together, they are regarded and treated as equals. Uh, common goals, uh, that they are working or striving toward common goals in cooperation and not in competition, and also uh, that there's institutional support, that there are some norms or laws or authority figures or uh, customs indicating that yes, you should interact with each other and you should interact as equals, that if those types of conditions are in place, that helps to maximize the potential for contact to promote positive outcomes between the groups. So that's kind of one branch of the contact literature. And another branch of the contact literature has really focused more on close relations across group boundaries, and in particular, talking about the role of cross-group friendships. Uh, because friendships tend to typify many of those conditions, they tend to involve uh, equal status, some form of cooperation, maybe not so much institutional support, um, but they also involve things like self-disclosure and perspective taking uh, that fuels a sense of caring and psychological investment in the other with whom you're interacting. And so there have been many studies in, in a variety of contexts, uh, you know, in, from our research and others, looking at relations, say, between blacks and whites in South Africa, between uh, Protestants and Catholics in Northern Ireland, currently between uh, different communities in Rwanda, um, that are tending to show that you know, the more positive con and meaningful contact experiences that you have with members of other groups, the more inclined you are not only to have positive atti towards, attitudes towards them and to trust them, but um, in the last couple of years, we've published some work showing among those groups in South Africa and Northern Ireland that the more positive, close contact that you have across those group lines, you also have more positive beliefs about the other group's intentions. It's a lot like the meta-perception idea that you are more likely to believe that they are truly invested in peace and you are less likely to believe that they are just saying they're interested in peace while working toward other strategic goals and that in turn predicts greater involvement for the participants themselves in reconciliation efforts. So, um, so it seems like there's yeah, a lot of these issues around perceived intentions that when we become psychologically invested in the welfare of other people, kind of turn on that switch for moral inclusion, we become more inclined to give them the benefit of the doubt, give them the same types of psychological and emotional resources that we typically reserve just for members of our own group. We could, yes. Yeah, just, just, just one point about, about the refugees and this motivated empathy component, which I think is so interesting, is that um, you know, empathy is, is, is a motivated process. It's not that some people are more, well, some people are more empathetic than others, but it seems to be controlled so much by the situation. And so one example of this, uh, of, of an excuse we might use to be cognitive misers and withhold our empathy towards uh, migrant children is, I, I just asked a, a uh, Americans, uh, a, a large group of Americans, to estimate how many of the children who are being brought across the border they think are being used as props by adults to gain entry mm -hmm. illegally. Mm -hmm. And um, the estimate over all <laughs> Americans was a third, 35%. That's how many of uh, these children mm -hmm. they think are being used as props. Um, the Department of Homeland Security has data on this. So I looked at the Department of Homeland Security data and for 2017, which is the one complete year they have data, the answer is 46 children. Wow. <laughs> out of, out of, out of uh, 
tens of thousands. Yeah. Right. So that so not forty six percent, but like oh point oh oh four. Exactly. Yeah. So so forty six children were suspected of being used, but the yeah. anecdote they used was an MS thirteen gang member who was bringing his actual child across the border. But it's unclear what that means. Maybe he is trying to leave, you know, so that, that includes, that's an over, yeah. well, probably a high estimate, yeah. right? right? Anybody suspected of. Yeah. And, and the degree to which people predict this, of course, is, is a strong predictor of their support for the family separation yeah. policy and their, uh, and their level of empathy for, for the parents and children, right? So um, what I think is, so one astonishing thing is that Democrats and Republicans are much closer to each other than they are to a reality. Right. Right. So Democrats are only overestimating by about 250 fold. Right? Um, but I, and I think one of the reasons for that might be, you know, if you if you think that they're legitimately being detained, you can take a little edge off the empathy how much you feel for them, and, and that might, you know, from a cognitive miser standpoint. We might look for excuses not to empathize, even if we don't realize we're doing it. We might do the same thing for felons, right? Oh, they kind of deserved it, so I, I'm not going to feel so bad. That, so I think it's just an important thing to realize that it's not, you know, this isn't just a Fox News effect. Yeah, right? yeah. This, is, this is something that might be some aspect of, of being human and that we have to all kind of grapple with. Against, yeah, yeah. Grapple. yeah. So we could keep going, but we want to give a chance for people to digest just a little bit. So I think Melchica is going to help us get into groups. Ah, there you are. <laughs> Once I catch the light video, that we can. <laughs> Thank you so and much. And then we'll reconvene, so there'll be plenty of more time to yes. hear from Emil and Linda. Great, well thank you so much, Olivia, and uh, thank you all so much for being here. My name is Mehra Kasandani. I'm the director of Critical Connections, uh, which is an organization here in the Valley that puts together events that offer analysis and opportunities for dialogue on issues related to the Muslim world and also um, American Muslims and other minority groups. And I would also like to extend my thanks so much to Emil and Linda mm -hmm. for sharing your insights and analysis. Uh, it's so important, especially as we here in the US become more increasingly diverse to sort of understand the science behind how we relate to one another and sort of the policy implications of that. And also perhaps check our own biases and how we tend to sort of do that in our own daily interactions with people. So that sort of takes us to the second part of our program now, which involves all of you. And so we wanted to give about 15 minutes for small group discussions where we would like um, you all to perhaps process what you just heard uh, the experts speak about, but really relate that to your own experiences of dehumanization. Either as you have experienced dehumanization yourself or have witnessed it, or perhaps even inadvertently dehumanized other people in your daily interactions. Um, so we'll spend about 15 minutes doing that, and then we'll reconvene as a large group and then engage our speakers um, for what we hope will be a lively Q&A session. <laughs> Anything you want to say? Yeah, say what um, interests you. Well, I'm having a really hard time with this all. It's more toward parents. And I can always sort of see the perspective of the one All right, so now before we get to everybody's questions and questions being posed to our speakers, we thought it would be nice to sort of hear a little bit about what bubbles up in your conversations in your small groups. So if there's anybody who would like to share just very briefly what was discussed, what were some of the themes that came up, um, we would be very interested to hear. So if there's anybody who wants to go first. 
one question that kind of came up. One question that came up when we were talking was, is there a difference between um, othering and dehumanizing? Did y'all hear that? Yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 If we don't know. <laughs> I wonder if anyone has any opinion on that. Or you guys might have some insight on that. Yeah, and we'll get to the questions in just a little bit, but if there are other people who would like to talk about what was discussed, that would be great. We, oui. Lucinda, do you want to speak? Yes, you're good. <laughs> so this one, this one fascinated me because, oh, I have to stand up? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> there was a woman in our group, who oh, I offered to let her be the speaking, who directed the play West Side Story at Amherst High School when it became a giant North controversy. Northampton. Northampton. No. Oh, you directed it at Northampton yes. where there wasn't the controversy, but yes. subsequent to the controversy at Amherst, right? Mm-hmm. And we talked a little bit about the complexity of different perceptions and and actually there were a lot of Puerto Ricans who were not offended by the play, but there were white people who were offended because they anticipated uh, without finding out, right. you know, what Puerto Rican people felt. So that, that, that was an interesting, and it sort of relates to a lot of what you were talking about. And I just mentioned about my life that I grew up in the worst of the Cold War, came of age in the 50s, and we were trained to hate Russians and be prepared to kill them. Yeah. And then I lived through and saw a public policy engineering of making us have people-to-people contact with the Russians because it was time to get along. And that didn't happen in any organic way. That was from the top. So they were aware of, maybe not the level of science, I mean, I'm blown away by what, I mean, so impressed. But they knew how to engineer this. And then, just very quickly, the next thing, I went, after graduate school, I went to live in Iran for two years. In 67, I went. and. Nobody here ever heard of Iran. They said, oh, is it near Nepal? <laughs> <laughs> when I got there, of course, Iranians knew everything about us. They adored Americans and everything about our culture, but they hated the fact that we kept the Shah on top of them. And then after the hostage crisis, when everybody here thought the Iranians hated us, they had no understanding of why they had a legitimate reason to. And I was hoping with the proposed treaty that we could engineer a people-to-people thing with Iran because I love the Iranian people having lived with them for two years and it didn't come to pass. So that's all. Thank you. Any other thoughts? Yeah, I something something I thought that was really interesting in our group that we talked about was we have a couple of um, people who are originally from Texas in our group. And um, it was just interesting thinking about dehumanization on, uh, um, on lines that aren't necessarily race or um, but are, are you know, on even accent. Um, one member of our group talked about feeling um, like there was uh, prejudice against her because of, of her accent and that because people perceive that accent as being um, having less IQ or, or um, of this nature. but. Um, and that's just interesting because we don't tend to think about groups like that within, you know, there are so many different categories of, of groups within groups, and uh, that, was, that was interesting to hear about, too. So we, maybe we'll take maybe one or two more of the reports, and then we'll direct our questions to our speakers. Or if our speakers would like to respond to some of what they've heard, that would be great. And there was a question among oh, them yeah. around the diff- whether the othering, othering, yes. yeah. and it was a specific. Question. Yeah, the, the the one piece of research that we've gotten that's spoken to that question, um, and the question is, um, is othering in, inherently dehumanizing? Um, the the one bit of evidence we have is when we ask people to rate different groups on this ascent dehumanization scale. We often ask about a number of groups, and a really consistent finding is that 
uh, many groups will humanize another group above their own. Um, so, you know, uh, groups in Eastern Europe will humanize groups in Scandinavia as higher on the scale than they themselves. And sometimes Americans will humanize, will say that Europeans are a little bit more evolved and civilized than us. And so it's, it's interesting in that if you ask the feeling thermometer measure, how warm or cold do you feel? Never, ever, ever do you see groups placing another group above themselves. Uh, but in this dehumanization measure, pretty frequently you do. Um, so that's another way in which they, they kind of dissociate from each other. Uh, Amir, can I just ask you uh, about that ascent of man measure? Uh, you uh, didn't discuss what the results were here in the US. What are some of the most dehumanized groups here in the US? Uh, different Muslim groups. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, Muslims in general, uh, Arabs, who, who Americans don't really distinguish between Arabs and Muslims, right? Um, uh, uh, Iranians, uh, Muslim refugees, they all are, are rated about um, 15 to 20 points lower on the scale than, than Americans and Europeans. Do you assess Native Americans? Yeah, we have assessed Native Americans uh, and African Americans and Hispanic Americans. They are also dehumanized, but not as much as, as Muslim groups. Wow. Yeah, and of course, this is one of the reasons why I really wanted to study this is I feel like our field actually hasn't done a very good job of looking at Islamophobia. You know, it's been very strong, it's really overt, especially with the dehumanization, but there aren't many people still in the field that are studying uh, any form of Islamophobia. Thank you. That's what we try and counter here. So. Um, I also, I just wanted to respond. I think it's a fascinating question if there's a difference between othering and dehumanizing. And I was thinking about some of the broader research perspectives that we have in, in social psychology around intergroup attitudes and this tendency that you see pretty much across all groups for in-group favoritism, that we just tend to like our own groups a bit more than we like other groups. Um, so I do think that there is some othering happening very often. I think we very naturally categorize ourselves and others into different groups, and then we have relatively positive associations to varying degrees with, with different groups. Um, and I think one of the interesting questions then becomes, uh, like at what level of in-group favoritism do, do we think it becomes problematic? Because I think a lot of us would agree that we kind of, it feels good to feel good about who we are, right? Like to have a healthy sense of group esteem. Um, and it's really hard to clarify <laughs> or pinpoint on any sort of scale at what point that discrepancy between how we might regard our own groups and other groups uh, becomes problematic. I think, so I've been thinking about this too, yeah. of course, this is what we do, yeah. um, but I think that where it becomes problematic to me, where I don't think it has to become problematic is we so often have to define an outgroup that contrasts with our in-group, but if you're a teacher, you can feel a social identity as a teacher, you don't have to have a competitive non-teacher group, and generally you don't. And that doesn't have to be true for any other group as well. We just allow it to be true. Yeah. So it's having a social identity feels good. This is like a human desire, but um, establishing an outgroup is something that we also, I think our brains kind of push us towards, but we don't have to go there. Yeah. We just, it's just easy to go there. Yeah. And we can also um, kind of go there in different ways. So there's other research on our field, in our field having to do with how we feel a sense of group identity, and then on the one hand, we feel like a, a psychological attachment to our groups, that we feel close to other group members, strong ties with other group members, um, we think of ourselves in terms of that group membership, but that's very different from a glorification of our group that involves some degree of status distinguishing or um, superiority, inferiority uh, in relation to other groups. So you can have like a healthy attachment to your group, so like, I love who I am, but that doesn't mean that you can't love who you are. Mm -hmm. um, what ha the, the problem usually comes in when people are like, I love who I am, and you should be more like me. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and if you're not like me, then we have a problem. I think that's where a, a lot of people kind of get defensive or feel threatened by difference as compared to people who are just happy to be part of the community that they're a part of, uh, and not to the detriment of other people's ability to be part of their own communities. Just for Sorry, related to that is what is the role of zero sum thinking in dehumanization? And I was and, and related to that, have you 
in, in, I'm thinking of like, I'm thinking in political terms, like a loss for for you means we get everything and that and it's all become a zero sum game. So I was wondering if you could talk about that and then um, just as a follow on, have you done any of this dehumanization work across political lines yet? Because that seems to be where where the conflicts, at least in our country, are really heading. Yeah, I, I will happily defer to Emil when it comes to dehumanization research, because he's done a lot more of that than I have. But I think usually uh, zero-sum framings uh, usually involve competition, right? Exactly as you were saying, the more that you get, the less for people like us. So, And unfortunately, it's very common if you look at a lot of survey data among white Americans, that when they think about the growth in proportion of the US population of non-white communities, or the browning of America, some people might say, that provokes an incredible sense of threat, and they tend to frame it, or we tend to frame it, in zero-sum terms. So we see that as automatically threatening, as compared to saying like, huh, more opportunities to learn about difference. You know, like that's usually not where we go first. Our minds, you know, we're usually very attentive to potential threats. Um, but we don't necessarily have to frame increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the US as a potential threat, like in fact, what I, I love this research by a researcher at the University of California, Berkeley, Victoria Plout. She's been doing some work where she looks at different framings of multiculturalism to see how white people might respond to it. And some of what she's done is uh, use kind of like typical representations of multiculturalism and then a multiculturalism plus condition where she makes explicit and like hits people over the head, like, and that means white people too, like you're included in that too. <laughs> and when you do that, whites are like, oh, I'm okay with multiculturalism. <laughs> it's just because there's that underlying assumption that multiculturalism excludes and therefore is threatening. So again, getting back to the, the framing in zero sum terms. Yeah, and for the, for the dehumanization bit, yeah, so Democrats and Republicans on this scale dehumanize each other about 25 points. So Democrats and Republicans dehumanize each other more than Americans dehumanize Muslims, for example. And, and it, it, is, it is a good predictor of a zero-sum type outcome. So the more you dehumanize, so the more, uh, if it's a Democrat, the more Democrats dehumanize Republicans, the more they endorse um, doing something that harms Republicans, even if it harms the country. Wow. And so, so that, that, I think, almost takes it a step beyond <laughs> zero sum, right? This is, this is uh, it, it predicts things like spite. Yeah. Wow. Hi. Um, I'm having a problem with the uh, term dehumanization. I liked all the information and statistics. I believe all that. Um, it seems, though, that what's really going on, and in many cases from what you said very consciously, people value certain people higher, give higher value and lower value to other people. And um, so for instance, I would bet some of the people in this room who value doctors over paid assassins. Um, and yet I'm, I'm not sure I would say that's dehumanizing paid assassins. It's saying that we don't like them as well. And I worry that half of the population of this country and probably other countries will get turned off, like the, um, the people in Hungary, will get turned off if you're saying they're dehumanizing them when they give them lower ratings. And so that we sort of end up with the conflict before we get past the original word. I, I think there's so the, um, I think there are a couple of really interesting things you mentioned. So first, uh, how much does rating people lower on the scale really indicate dehumanization? I think that's that's a good question. It's a good point. This is one of the reasons why we've tried to measure it a couple of different ways. Um, so just to give you a sense of the other ways, we've also just given people traits like. Um, how savage and barbaric are these people? Um, how, how cultured and civilized are these people? So um, those are in, in pretty close concordance, uh, <coughs> the, the ratings on the dehumanization scale and the multi-item measure, and they're pretty interchangeable whenever we're trying to predict any of the outcomes. 
So I, I totally agree that the scale, one of the nice things about the scale is it's very intuitive, um, it's visually, uh, people know what you're, you're talking about, but it also could capture a bunch of different things. Um, and, and that's a totally valid concern. So it's important to have these other measures of dehumanization to compare it to. The other part of your question, which I think is really important, is how do people respond to this information? Right? When I come back to a group and say, you are dehumanizing this other group, um, that, so to me, I'm in a communications department, and to me, that's a communications problem. Right? That is a problem with how you take this information then and do something good with it. Right? If, you, if you gather the information and in the process of gathering it and disseminating it, you make things worse, that is something that I have to consider. Right? Because ultimately I'm here, I came here from the peace building world to become a scientist. Right? And so I don't want to lose track of the mm -hmm. fact that the reason I'm here is to put science to work for peace, mm -hmm. not just to put science to work. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think that's a, a totally valid concern, and, mm -hmm. uh, and it's something that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad that I'm working right now with policymakers. So I'm in a collaboration, and those are the types of things mm -hmm. they're always putting to me that scientists never do. Mm -hmm. Scientists never take you to task over things mm -hmm. like this at a conference. And I think it's really important to have people take scientists to task over exactly these types of things. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Mm -hmm. um, this is for both of you. I'm wondering in the research that you do, if you break down, uh, if you look at outcomes based on age of your subjects, and if there's differences by age? Yeah, um, there are some differences by age. It really depends on the type of project uh, and, and the region or the country where we're working. So, um, you know, if you think, like, I'm just thinking about one of the examples of the, of the data that we have in Rwanda, um, where we're looking at different programs that might promote like leadership or community building or reconciliation um, that tend to be organized around different age groups, people who were adults during the genocide or people who were very young during the genocide and, and trying to think about what types of programs seem to be most appropriate for people at those different ages. Some of, some of the other research that I do has to look at uh, activism for racial justice among white people or people who might identify as white allies um, and seeing how people who were active during the civil rights movement might compare to younger generations of, of people getting involved and, and whether that kind of longer history of experience contributes somehow differently. Um, I'd have to say, in most of the studies that I've, I've looked at, I've tended to you know, do some brief comparisons by age, uh, but I tend to find kind of similar trends so that the patterns are very similar. And then we end up using, like especially for um, nationally representative survey data, uh, we would look at age and gender and socioeconomic status and level of education and political orientation as control variables, you know, making sure that any effects that we're looking at of these other characteristics <coughs> that we're interested in, uh, such as some of the relationships we've looked at between contact experiences, diversity <coughs> in one's local <coughs> environment, and willingness to welcome immigrant communities into your community, uh, things like that, we would tend to use those as, as control variables to make sure that any effects we're observing of contact are not inadvertently due to those demographic factors. And then every once in a while, when you see some of those playing some role, then we'll test them as moderators to see if they interact with the variables that we're mostly interested in. But overall, I've tended to see ages, um, seeing similar trends across different age groups. Yeah, the, 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 well, just one thing to point, one, one of the processes I've been looking at aside from dehumanization and empathy is the tendency to collectively blame an entire group for the actions of individuals. Mm -hmm. And this is really relevant for Muslims, right? Because Americans have a strong tendency to blame all Muslims, right? A quarter of the world's population for what one Muslim guy does in one part of the world. Um, and this is, this is quite strong, and I've found um, interventions that can decrease this perception and change people's policy preferences, which is great. The, the interesting thing is it never works for millennials, the, the really young ones, but that's because they don't collectively blame Muslims, right? They're already down at floor, and that's why it doesn't work. And so that, that is the strongest age effect I've seen, actually, is the tendency to collectively blame 
a group for the actions of individuals. And I don't know if that's a generational thing or if that's something that's developmental. If we just learn over time to blame groups more and more or if, it's, if it has something more to do with generations. And I, I just think that that's a fascinating thing. And the last thing is that um, the relationship, uh, these relationships between various prejudice measures, they're generally a positive correlation in the US. So <coughs> older Americans have stronger biases. It's reversed in Hungary. Right? In Eastern mm. Europe, you see the opposite pattern. Okay, so just mentioning those examples, I just have to share one other example <laughs> related to age, which is what I use with my undergraduate students, um, because there are some national polls of millennials that have shown that they're like the most tolerant generation, and uh, when I share them with my undergraduate students, they feel all good, and you can kind of see their <laughs> um, And then later on in the semester, when we start talking about discrimination, I show them data from the same polls, the exact same polls, uh, showing that about half of white millennials believe that discrimination against black people, I'm sorry, against white people is as big a problem in the United States as discrimination against black people. And then they don't sit quite so high. Uh, but again, and, and, and I mentioned that as a particular example, right? Because we would like to think that that is something that would extinguish with more generations past Jim Crow segregation. Um, and it is strikingly stable. Hi, um, I found myself curious as to when you performed these uh, dehumanization uh, tests, like um, what specific years, and by extension, if you're considering doing follow-ups to see if these trends change over time, if there's specific moments in time when any of these seem particularly strong. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so yes, we've done a lot of longitudinal stuff. The most, the most interesting one for me was totally accidental, I promise. <laughs> um, it was that we started doing this research uh, a couple of months before the Boston Marathon bombings, when my, my main colleague and I, Noor Katayli, we, we were both in Boston at the time. So we were doing this research across the US, and we had samples at a bunch of different time points as we were testing out this measure, and then we had plans to, to assess it, and so we just ran the study right after the Boston Marathon bombings, and the, one of the groups we were asking about is Arabs. And if you remember, right after the Boston Marathon bombings, there was a lot of information that it was definitely Arabs that committed this, right? There was, there was the, the, the profile picture that was sent yeah. around of an Arab guy, so people were, were clear that it was an Arab guy, then, of course, it turned out that they weren't Arabs. And so we had data from the months leading up, immediately afterwards, when the perpetrator was thought to be Arab, and then months afterwards. And there was a clear spike. So uh, Arabs were dehumanized about 12 points before and months after, and about 17 points right afterwards. So, so there was a clear, and, and this, is, you know, this is a nationwide sample. It's not just in Boston. So there was a, there was a clear response to that there. The other anecdotal example is even, even stronger, which is I'd also been assessing uh, dehumanization of Muslims among Hungarians. And this started before the refugee crisis of the influx of Muslims into Europe. And uh, one of the things that Hungary did was the Hungarian government, who's very right wing, they, they started posting um, billboards around the country and the billboards said things like, if you come to our country, you cannot steal our jobs. If you come to our country, you can't change our culture. If you come to our country, you can't convert us to your religion. And they were all in Hungarian, right? So they're ostensibly directed at the refugees, but of course, they're, they're totally illegible to them. So of course, it's directed at the population. And it was incredibly effective, because dehumanization of Muslims before this campaign was 15 points, and afterwards was 30. And so, so these. You know, policy, like, it, it can work. It's, it's easy to dehumanize another group. We've been doing it as a species for a long time, and probably we're doing it because it's an incredibly effective tool, and it's easy to kind of turn that switch, I think, in people's minds. I was wondering if the... <laughs> If your uh, concept of dehumanization, how that relates to what I'm going to call superhumanization. And what made me think of that was a family member who, by birth, is Asian and by appearance is Asian. 
and she wanted to do poorly in math in high school <laughs> to sort of fight a stereotype. And I said, well, you know, at least it's a positive stereotype. She said, yeah, but it's no less confining. Mm -hmm. And I just wondered what you would have to say about something like that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's a really interesting observation. And the, the, the one bit that I, I, that's been hammering in my head is, at one point on one of these surveys, I asked uh, American adults, I told them about the marshmallow test. Do you know about the marshmallow test? Mm -hmm. So you, you, know, you put the one marshmallow in front of like a four-year-old, yeah. you leave the room and say, hey, if you can hold off eating this, then I'll give you two when I get back. And, and the test is how long will they wait before they shove that in their mouth and start chewing it. And so I, I told the participants about this, and I said, okay, here's the average amount of time that an American, a white American child will wait. How long do you think children from these other backgrounds will wait? Mm -hmm. And if they are black or Hispanic, they'd say, oh, they wouldn't wait quite as long, right? That they don't have as much impulse control. Mm -hmm. If it was a Muslim child, they said they would wait much longer. Right? And I think this is, this is uh, part of that, that, that superhumanizing. It's almost like Muslims have this remarkable self-control. I mean, this is how the, the stereotype goes, right? They have this remarkable self-control, but they've twisted it into a way where they can like infiltrate our government and be a sleeper cell. Like that's the, that, that's how it's, I think, turned around where something, where they acknowledge, Americans can acknowledge that they have a trait that's very human, right? Self-control, um, but that it, it can still be used as a way to define them as less than human, which I think is just like the, you know, humans go through remarkable like cognitive gymnastics to justify beliefs, and this is, I think, one of those examples of, uh, of the, that process. If, if I could add, um, so yeah, I see this, again, I, I'm not as entrenched in the world of dehumanization research, so I'm thinking about it more in relation to stereotypes and stereotyping, and there's a, a concept known as stereotype threat, this threat of confirming an, a stereotype about your group, um, and it's usually been thought about in terms of confirming negative stereotypes about your group. So if a, a stereotype is salient, or if we're in a, a testing context, and we happen to be Latino or African American, and we're led to think that this test is diagnostic somehow of our intellectual abilities, we might underperform on that test. And just to give you an example, there have been studies done of Asian American females where they've primed either her female identity or her Asian identity and then had her do a difficult math test. And when primed as female, she underperforms. And when primed as Asian, she overperforms. So that's kind of a part of the function of stereotypes is like the susceptibility that we have in ways that influence our behavior. Um, regarding the another aspect about stereotyping is there's been a fair amount of research on the the functional nature of stereotypes. I think we're oftentimes inclined to think that stereotypes um, <coughs> represent something about people, but I think they actually represent, in, to a large extent, the motivations that we have as, of, as perceivers of other people and representing our relationships to them and with them. So uh, an example that I use in my undergraduate class are stereotypes of Native Americans for over long periods of time in this country where, you know, if you, I actually found like uh, text, history textbooks from the Boston Public Schools from the early 1900s where all of the representations of Native Americans are being savage and, and um, just really vicious. And then you think about in the 1970s how uh, Native American imagery was evoked like by the Ad Council to promote peace and reduce pollution and, and all of these types of things and how there's something about the nature of our relationship to Native Americans at these different periods in history that is contributing to that shift in stereotypes, because if it were something about the people themselves, you shouldn't see such extreme shifts mm -hmm. in the stereotypes. So there's, there's actually a fair amount of research done by people like Susan Fisk at Princeton University under what she calls the stereotype content model, that she says that we have these kind of relational or functional understandings of the stereotypes of different groups in relation to their relative status positions and the potential for threat to us that they pose in our society. So you would tend to see um, groups, <coughs> their stereotypes laid out on kind of two dimensions, a dimension of warmth, how warm or cold we feel towards them, how much we can trust them or not, and then in terms of competence that has to do with their status. 
right? So you can think about high status groups that are perceived to be ones that we can't trust. You know, unfortunately, oftentimes Jews in different Asian communities end up in that quadrant. And scientists. And scientists. <laughs> and <laughs> and <laughs> scientists. And lawyers. Um, yeah, there's a few different types of groups that are perceived to be a little bit more cold but competent. Um, and then there's the ones who are perceived to be incompetent or less competent but warm, like the elderly, those with disabilities. Right? But again, it's kind of representing our, our understanding of our functional relationships to them. It's not necessarily about those people as much as how we are inclined to relate to them given our own status and our own position. Hi, Shell Horowitz from Going Beyond Sustainability. <laughs> I want to first thank you for articulating the insight that we demonize those we perceive as demonizing us. That's, I think, a really interesting frame and one that, that explains a lot. Um, you both kind of looked in the window of my question without opening the door. I want you to throw the door open and it's, where do we find the hope? How do we make the change? How do we build that peace that you want to do? Um, how, both as individuals and a society, how do we counter the negative effects of all of this othering? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, is, this is, to me, the important question. Um, and it's also really hard. Turns out it's, it's much harder to uh, humanize people than it is to dehumanize them. Right? It's much harder to get people to like a group than to make them dislike the group. Um, and I think part of this is just um, you know, I think a lot of, of how our brains evolved and all of what we think of as human history, right? Like the Roman Empire and the Mongol invasion and the Versailles Treaty and, you know, women's suffrage, everything is like a tiny little sliver. It's the last 10,000 years. But for hundreds of thousands of years before that, we were tiny little tribes of humans fighting like hell against other little tribes of humans, right? From the archeological record, 15% of every generation died from warfare for hundreds of thousands of years. And so that's the environment that our brains evolved in. And if that's the environment that your brain involves in, then yeah, in-group affiliation, being able to identify your out-group by an arbitrary characteristic because they probably look just like you, um, being able to do these things, have that be flexible in case you like take them over and take some of them into your group, like all of these things would follow. And it seems that that's how we, we, we think of outgroups, right? We have to teach our children how to be racist, right? Young children have no concept of race. Only by about five years do they have some kind of preference and ability to understand that this is a thing. So we, we as a society actively have to teach kids what the salient group characteristics are. And I think that's just a consequence of how our brains evolve, the environment our brains evolved in. So um, with, with that being said, I feel like our, our default state is, if we're thinking about interpersonal situations, if you rely on the default, you're gonna be decent and kind, right? A affiliative, uh, altruistic. These are the things that keep these small groups of humans together and working well, like a, like a nice machine. But if you think about an inner group context, if you define it as inner group, then your instinct, I think, will be exactly the type of thing that will escalate conflict. And, and the problem is we often just rely on our intuitions, and our intuitions just often backfire. And that's why these interventions are so damn hard, and why uh, you know, fanning the flames of conflict is so damn easy, because it comes intuitively to us. So that being said, I think, the, the, the saving grace of that is that our brains have to be flexible. Um, and, and we have brains that are almost infinitely flexible. Like every inclination we have can be retrained. And it's not just it can be, but that's like down to the subcellular level, our brains are made to change. Like everything about them is made to change. And we, we as humans have gained conscious control over crazy unconscious processes like body temperature. You know, if people can gain conscious control over body temperature, then surely we can gain conscious control over racism. Right? That's such a smaller, easier thing to get a hold of. Um, so, but the last thing is the hope. <laughs> like, what actually works? Well, I think there, there, um, there's a set of things that work that are like, um, our brains uh, can learn through training, 
and you can you can set up your own habits. Um, our brains can also we can also gain conscious control over these unconscious processes. So, for example, a great intervention for stereotype threat to eliminate stereotype threat is to teach about stereotype threat. Right? <laughs> Once you understand it, then it, it apparently inoculates you against experiencing it. And there are other psychological biases that this is true for. So in this case, your, your own awareness of your own mind can help you um, relieve yourself from its control over you. Right? So, so that is, is, to me, incredibly hopeful. And I think, and th this is a message, I'm trying to figure out how to frame this, but I I'm going to try here for the first time. It is um, to, to embrace and be fascinated by your own racism. <laughs> and, and the reason I say that is I think that we have so much fear of being or thinking things that are racist that that is what prevents you from gaining conscious control over it, right? Mm -hmm. What you have to do is be thrilled when a bit of your racism pokes okay. through because okay. then you have the opportunity to change it. Mm -hmm. If you don't allow yourself that awareness, then you can't go to the next step. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think that's the, 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 the message I'd like to give paradoxically is to be mm -hmm. totally thrilled whenever <laughs> you witness your own racism because that has to be the first step to kind of gaining conscious control. Mm -hmm. So just to kind of echo and follow up with some things that, that Emil was just talking about, so there actually there is actually a fair amount of research to suggest it's called like the uh, inter-individual, intergroup discontinuity effect um, by Insko and Wilch, Welchud and all those folks who basically show that when things are framed in intergroup terms, uh, we fr we think about things more in terms of fear and threat and competition than we do when they're framed in inter-individual terms. So there are these things about group processes where. Um, a lot of our assumptions about kind of human nature, how we interact with people, just start to break down. You know, in terms of interpersonal relations, we assume that people are on the same page we are, that we're similar to each other. In an intergroup context, we assume difference, we assume dislike, we assume all of these negative things. So that's kind of like a, a little bit of an uphill battle that, that we have to face. Um, I, for me, part of the, the hopeful part comes through also in relation to training, um, and it, it, it's kind of trying to do the reverse of what I was talking about around being cognitive misers or, or, or being miserly in how, how we approach things. I think uh, one of the challenges, though, is that it's just more effortful, right? If we want to be efficient, which is how we're often inclined to be because it serves us well in many ways, we will not pay too much attention when we see people walking down the street and we'll just basically process their approximate age, gender, and race. and and then think from that information whether they're a threat to us or not, and then be done. Uh, so we take very quick snapshots of, of other people in our social environments, and we don't necessarily um, act in generous ways towards them with our, with our cognitive, emotional, and motivational resources. So for, for me, I find hope in, in trying to encourage people and to train people to to just be more generous in, in, in using their resources. That it's not necessarily, like our goal is not always to be the most efficient as possible, but maybe to kind of shift the narrative and think like, you know, to, to learn the most possible. And so kind of related to what Emil was talking about in terms of like, you know, yay, I'm racist, I get to learn. Um, there's actually also research that talks about um, having uh, more of a learning orientation as compared to a performance orientation. So I think we are riddled with fear. I think we are oftentimes so concerned about how we're going to be perceived that we won't engage in discussions about race. We won't say what we actually think. Um, and people might still interpret that as bias because they see us hesitating when we re respond to things. So we might feel anxious about talking about race, and people might encode that as, oh, they're trying to hide how racist they are. So I think the more that we can actually just allow ourselves to be vulnerable and just kind of give it a shot, like, I, this is oftentimes what I recommend when I'm asked to teach or lead or facilitate racial bias workshops. I, I, you know, invoke things like, you know, why not try? Like, you know, like why, why not try to engage somebody in conversation when we, you know, when we first t try to learn a new language, we don't expect to speak fluently. When we first try to learn how to play tennis, we don't know how to hold our wrist to hold the racket right, like we learn. And so we should think about the same thing when it comes to talking about race, when it comes to talking about racism, when it comes to talking about all of these different types of things that we might not be as accustomed to doing because we get better with practice. 
and the more we're focused on learning from those experiences, like what Emil was talking about, um, the more we're focused on the other, and the more we're focused on the content of what we're learning through that, and the less self-conscious we are, the less attention we have focused on ourselves. So I think that's, that's part of the issue, is we're so self-focused when we, we enter into these spaces. Um, so I guess I would agree with Emil that kind of encouraging more of a focus on learning uh, in the pursuit of reducing a self-focus is, is often really helpful. And I also think um, something as simple as giving people instructions <laughs> is really helpful. Um, so there's some work on behavioral scripts to suggest that, you know, if people are in an awkward situation, that will introduce a lot of anxiety. People won't know how to act. But if you say, like, your job here <laughs> is to talk about this and to really learn what the other people are talking about, that can help guide those discussions. Thank you so much. Um, so we are nearing the end of our program. So I think what we might do is just take a few questions all together and then have you guys respond if that's OK, just because we're nearing the end. That's OK. Where's from? Are you sure? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, I have uh, two questions for you. One is, um, in any way do you t in your research, do you take in, in involved in that research the cultural and social, social cultural and historical reality of the group that, that, that the respondents are from? So for instance, I wouldn't expect uh, an American to have the same response to Roma as they do in Hungary. Um, Th but there's a reason for that. There's yeah. a reason for that. Um, so how much, if any, do you take this larger environment? That's only one question. That's <laughs> one question. I have another one, but I won't ask Thank it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <laughs> how much do you take that into account, if at all? Um, on the question of that sense of being persecuted, of being othered and, uh, and dehumanized, that strikes me as the easiest thing to manipulate. I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to, especially in large groups, to dehumanize someone if the audience isn't already there, at least part way. But it's very easy to make people feel like these people are out to get me. I mean, that's what happened in Rwanda. That's what happened in Germany. It's yeah, happening yeah, now in the United States. Yeah. One last question. Um, Tats? Yeah. No, her. Oh. She's been trying to ask for a long time. I'm sorry that I can't remember the third group that you said uh, 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 was uh, the most uh, dehumanized in this country. You said it was Muslim, Arabs, and... Oh, well, it was different, different derivations of Muslim groups. Because Arabs are perceived to be Muslims by most Americans, right. so they're, they're interchangeable in most American minds. So there wasn't the third group that you mentioned? Uh, well, you mentioned Iranians. Yeah, Walmart. Iranians. Iranians, yeah. okay. So, what struck me was that you didn't mention black Americans, and that really surprised me. So could you just comment on where the racism against blacks fits? Yeah. Uh, oh. Is that? I think those I, are the three questions. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, well, Go do you want it. to start with the... I mean, I'll just, I'll very briefly say in response to the question about do we take into account the cultural, social, and historical reality of the groups? Well, yeah. Um, I would say... You know, from our training, we do tend to study uh, like relatively universal processes, things like identifying with groups, feeling threatened by other groups, uh, experiences of contact with different groups as, as, as relatively general processes that might apply and manifest themselves in different types of contexts. But then within those different contexts, of course, we have to take into account the, the local manifestations of conflict, the, the different um, triggers of, of conflict, the, the memories that people have of instances um, where group difference really matters. So I think, I, I, I personally come from a tradition of contextualized social psychology where we try to understand these general principles, how they operate in many different contexts, but then examine them, how they manifest in more specific contexts. Yeah, 
so I, um, before I became a psychologist and a neuroscientist, I, um, I, I just found myself in these conflict regions, mostly just by happenstance. Uh, in South Africa, right at the end of apartheid, and in Sri Lanka during their, their civil war, and in Ireland, uh, I, I volunteered at this camp with Catholic and Protestant kids. And what really stood out to me was it seemed to be that the, the things in people's minds that was driving them to conflict was eerily similar across these different conflicts, but the conflicts couldn't have been more different, right? They're on three different continents, different religions, ethnicities, histories, cultures, languages, everything was different about them, but, but uh, I, I just saw these patterns. And so, yes, there are differences between the groups, but I'm really compelled by the, the remarkable similarity about the, the consequences of being uh, having a human brain and being in a conflict situation. Like the similarities stand out to me much more than the differences do, as, as important as the differences are. Dehumanization? Um, dehumanization and uh, briefly? Lack of flexibility. Lack of flexibility on black Americans. Yes. Uh, yeah, so um, I think there. So, so this is a little bit half-baked, and, and Linda has baked this a little bit longer than I have, so I'll give the half-baked response, and then we'll, we'll bring it all the way home. Um, so I, I think there are, some, uh, there are some big differences between perceptions of Muslims and perceptions of African Americans, and I feel like part of it is that um, American perceptions of African Americans have been steeping for so long that they're, um, they're, they're more entrenched and they're more, they've gone through more stages, right? Like the, the stages of, of grief, you know, you have a bunch of different stages. There must be like the stages of racism too. And like, you know, you, you, you hear an argument against racism and then you develop a clever counter argument. And then there's an argument against that one. And I feel like we might've gone through so many stages with African-Americans that, that things seem like they're more stable and, and hard to push around. Whereas with Muslims, there are all these really strong feelings, and when you get down to it, there's a really shaky foundation that they're built on, right? There's some half-baked ideas about how Muslims think about us and how they want to change our culture and implement Sharia law, and you know, it's like it isn't, it hasn't gone through that that full stage. And so, what I've found is that interventions to try to combat uh, anti-Muslim bias go over better than interventions to combat uh, anti-Black bias. Um, and, and so I, I, you know, this, this is just from my, my personal experience doing the research on these groups so far, but uh, Yeah, I mean, I guess my thoughts about race relations have been percolating for a while. I was born and raised in a city that was about 85% black, 25% uh, unemployment. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think about it a lot in terms of status and position that a kind of the, the, the white American narrative in relation to to black Americans is more like, oh, black Americans are trying to rise up, we have to keep pushing them down. Where I think a bit more of the narrative around Arabs and Muslims is more like, you know, external to internal threat. So it's just kind of like a different movement or a different sense. Um, and I think especially like since 9-11, the idea like, oh wow, they actually effectively hurt us um, makes that, that threat, you know, of, of um, change and safety and those types of concerns to, to seem a little more like real or material in some way as compared to just trying to like keep an underclass down. Mm -hmm. So I, I see it more in those terms. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there was one more. There was. Can you remind us of? Oh, just the, 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 the ability to manipulate the, uh, the the self-victimization, uh, that sense of self-victim. Yeah, it's so compelling, isn't it? Right. I mean, it's, yeah. it's really, it's truly amazing. You know, we're, as human beings, we are just so much more attuned to potential threats than we are to like potential benefits. I mean, even like Kahneman and Tversky, like gain loss theory, like, you know, we're, we're more concerned about losing things than gaining things. We want to protect our resources. So. You know, if you think about it in terms of contact or positive intergroup relations, we can have a whole history of positive relations, and then there will be like one negative instance, and then from that point forward, we'll be suspicious because we know the negative can happen. Um, so we just we kind of have this little like a little bit of a trigger, a quick trigger finger or something yeah. in relation and to threats. There's there's also um, so 
one of the things that, that was really remarkable to me starting to do neuroimaging is that um, uh, you put someone in a scanner, brains are really noisy, mm -hmm. people are thinking about they're, they're hungry, they're tired, they're not thinking about what you want them to be thinking about. Oftentimes you put them in a scanner and you don't get, you get like a smear of activity all over the place. But there's a couple of activities that give you like rock solid uh, localization of brain activity. And one of them is getting people to think about other people's minds. I can put any of you in a scanner and in 10 minutes I can tell you precisely what brain regions you are using to think about somebody else's mind. And one of them that seems dedicated to this is, is right here, ab above and, and behind your right ear. Right? It's lateralized to the right side, the right temporoparietal junction. It's a tiny little region that just all it cares about, as far as we can tell, all it cares about is other people's thoughts. <laughs> and, and, you know, and it makes sense. We're always thinking about other people's thoughts. Do, do you think I'm smart? Do you think, you know, uh, th does she like me? You know, these are like things we're always engaged in. And I think it's, you know, it's the combination of having this dedicated neural machinery that's always like hammering away, trying to figure out what's in other people's minds, and this negativity bias, and this tribalism, and wham, you have these three things. It's like the, the perfect storm, where, where you have uh, this tendency to, to just glom on to, oh, of course that group is thinking these negative things about me. I think that it just, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's not an accident, it's, a, it's a, like a construct of of how our brains are designed, that all of these things point to this, this one compelling message. Not too hopeful. <laughs> Not too hopeful. Yeah. Part of your statement was that that's so easy to manipulate, yeah. and yeah. that's what we see in conflict situations across the world, and somewhat alarmingly here. Yeah. <laughs> but again, like the, the great hope is that you know we, we have these brains that are so darn flexible that, that we, we have the capacity for one-shot learning. No. Right? You can hear something that blows your mind once, and it can change the rest of your life. And that is just astonishing that, that we humans are able to do this also. So it's, you know, I feel like there's so much power we have, it's just a matter of finding the right triggers that can counteract the, these processes. And I mean, just is, <laughs> is perhaps not the right word. It's hard. But, but I feel like they're there, right? And the people who have made these dramatic transformations, like I got to talk to this group of former white nationalists last summer. These are people who have made a dramatic transformation, and they're all the way, they're all in. You don't see any residual. It's not like they're, they're like one step, one foot back in white nationalism. They're, they're, they're fully over here. And it's amazing seeing someone who changes an ideology and just completely flip-flops. What did you so, do? What, I didn't do it. I had nothing to do with it. I was trying to figure out what happened for them. What happened for them, one of the things is that they were treated really decently by someone whose decency they didn't deserve. But that's one thing they cite. And the thing that they cite that pushes them away from transformation is people trying to shame them. Uh -huh. And I think it's important that that's one of like the liberals' go-to strategies, yeah. try to shame yeah. conservatives and what they've done. And that, that overwhelmingly, they cite that as the exact wrong <coughs> Uh, thank you, thank you so much, Emilio. And uh, I agree with you. Thank you all for making it out tonight on a Wednesday. And uh, for upcoming Critical in Actions events, we have quite a few. Um, on Sunday, October 28th, um, we are co sponsoring a event called Muslim Women in Politics Shaping Narratives, Shaping Perceptions. Um, this will be with the Hira Amatul Wadud and Shaheen Pasha. Um, and then in uh, November, we are sponsoring um, an event called Not In Our Name, Civilian Casualties in American Wars at Flywheel Arts Collectives in East Hampton, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, this is from seven to nine as well. And that other event is at the uh, First Churches in Northampton. Um, Edwards. Edward, Edwards Church, sorry, sorry. Um, and uh, you can find more information about our upcoming events on our website, criticalconnections.org. And um, we have some lovely flyers put together on our spring series here. Um, so if you want to get a head start on that, you, you can. And uh, again, thank you so much, both of you. It's really fun having two of you here because you, you guys like talk to each other and, and you're, you're in this research together and it, and it shows and it's inspiring. So thank you. Thank you.